Uh, we're going to be going through the uh, book of Isaiah in chapter uh, 30. So just so you have an idea, we're going to be at. We're going to be through quite a bit of Isaiah, but the majority of the chapter will be in Isaiah uh, chapter 30. Um, so Isaiah is um, the first of the major prophets. Uh, there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Um, he's the first of the, the major prophets, Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah, uh, are the other ones which uh, are part of the, 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 um, the major prophets. They're major prophets because the amount of material that they, they cover is very large. The minor prophets are very small books, and that's why they're called major versus minor prophets. Uh, Isaiah uh, uh, taught uh, or ministered to Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, between the area of 760 to 650 BC, approximately, and he's under four kings: uh, King uh, Uzziah, um, uh, through Hezekiah, and ended before the reign of Manasseh. And we find that uh, in Isaiah, the first chapter and the first verse. And it said, "The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, uh, Jotham, uh, Ahaz, and uh, he, Hezekiah, uh, king of Judah." Um, I particularly like the book of Isaiah because it has some of my, my most favorite chapters. The first being Isaiah, uh, the sixth chapter, uh, verses 1 through 8. Now this is, you, when you hear it, you'll probably go, oh yeah, I remember this one. This is um, uh, Revelation song. If you remember Revelation song, the beginning of this, the, the, a lot of the verses come from this very chapter. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah dies, died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood Seraphim, each one having six wings. With two, with two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I love that because, again, it's Revelation song, and it talks about the holiness of God and how great and awesome, how powerful our God is that we serve. And then the second one uh, is the very last part of that in, in, verse, in verse 8 uh, when uh, the commissioning of Isaiah. And it says, And I heard the, Lord, the, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am. Send me. Now, that really gets me every time because it's just that desire to be a servant. And we think about how God has saved us and the things... <laughs> This is just the beginning. <laughs> we got, I got the whole thing to go through. <laughs> no, but seriously, when we think about how awesome God is, how much he loves us, how much he's done for us, just to have that heart of says, I'll do it. Now, the authorship of Isaiah, people say that the book is written by three different authors. Uh, they say that for one reason. Uh, they say that because they, they look at verses, I think it's 39, 1 through 39, uh, 40 to 54, and 55 to 66, because it's written uh, pre-exile. Uh, it looks like it's written during the exile, and it's written after the exile by the way that the author speaks. Um, but um, the reality is, um, they, the reason that they don't want to accept that uh, this book is divine is for one simple reason. If the book's divine, then there has to be a divine author. If there has to be a divine author, then I got some problems. And so, no God, again, the, the, the old saying goes, it's no God, no punishment. And so the world will say, okay, there, this, is, this is written by some, a good book, it's a good poetic book, but in reality, it's, it's not really from God. So, uh, but again, uh, if we look at it from the fact that God wrote it through Isaiah, it makes complete sense. Um, Okay, again, we'll be going through uh, verses 31 through 26. Uh, now, the history of, of this particular part of the book um, is uh, the Assyrian nation uh, were used, was used by God to, do, to judge Israel and take them out of the land into captivity. 
but that's all they're supposed to do. Uh, however, Satan was using um, uh, the Assyrian kingdom uh, to attack Judah, uh, which God had done, which God had not appointed for uh, for for Judah to go through. Uh, we see that uh, first in Second Kings uh, eighteen nine through uh, verse sixteen. Uh, and it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, uh, which was the seventh year of Hoshai, the son of Elu, uh, the king of Israel, that Shalemesar, which I believe is the father of Sennacherib, we'll be covering in a few moments, uh, came up against Samaria and besieged it. At the end of three years, he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshai, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. Then the king of Assyria carried away captive to Assyria and put them in Hala by their Hab by the harbor, uh, the river of Gozum, uh, and the cities of uh, the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, uh, their God, but transgressed his covenant, and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded, uh, and they would neither hear nor do them. Uh, so, and when we, we'll go through it in a few moments, but when uh, the Rakshak, I can't even say the guy's name, the Rabshaka, which is basically the general of Sennacherib, when he comes, he even mentions that um, in his, his comments. Uh, and we find that in 36, 4 through 10. Uh, in the last verse, it says, uh, Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Now, he had said that about Israel because, again, Israel is being judged because of their sins and because of not following the Lord. Um, now, I always go through this, this part at the very beginning whenever I talk about Israel and Judah for those people who don't understand. Uh, for years when I read the stories of Israel and Judah, I was always very confused. Israel, Judah, it makes no sense. Um, so a little background for those who don't know. Um, uh, king David uh, was um, uh, established the kingdom. He took it, Saul was first originally king, then David. From David, it went to Solomon. Solomon uh, had the bazillion wives, 90 some up, 90 plus wives, uh, all these concubines. The problem was that he began serving the other gods. Uh, and God said, okay, because of this, and because you've not followed me, and so, so these other gods, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, and it will not be a united kingdom. Uh, under his son, uh, Rehoboam, I believe it is, it was Rehoboam and Jeroboam. There's two of them, the names are kind of, kind of confusing. Uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. When he came to power, the people said, hey, he went to his coronation uh, location, and the people came to him and said, hey, your dad was really really tough on us and really hard. Uh, could you be easy on us? And uh, he went and talked uh, to the elders of the people, and they said, yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. And he went and talked to his cohorts, his friends, and they said, no, no, make it really tough for them. And it's a very, very infamous line. He says, uh, he goes back to them and said, my thumb will be harder than my entire father's fist was to you. Uh, and so uh, he, he came and told them that, and then the people said, okay, we're gone. And so the ten tribes took off, and they went to the north, and then the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, they stayed to the south. And then the kingdom was divided. Jeroboam, which was a general under Solomon, uh, God told him that he was going to be the king over the northern kingdom, over Israel, uh, and then uh, Rehoboam would remain king, and the, the Davidic line, or through David, would pass through Rehoboam's and Rehoboam's family to, to the very end, uh, which we're, uh, in this part through Isaiah we're coming up to. Um, and so the kingdoms were divided. Uh, all the kings of the north of Israel, those, those, those generals, those kings, were all evil. Every single one of them was evil. Uh, the way they came to power usually is they killed the guy who was the king before them. And that's how they became king. Is Okay, I want to be king. Oh, where's the king at? <coughs> Stab him. Okay, my turn. And that's how it usually went. Uh, most of the kings, it wasn't a, a transition from, uh, from like they did in David's uh, line, line, lineage, where uh, one son became the next king, the next son, and the whole way down the line. In Israel, it was the guy had the nice best sword, and was the fastest to stab somebody. And that's the way that usually, that's the way that Israel was. Um, uh, Elisha, the prophet, he ministered, uh, and Elijah, both of them, ministered to Israel during that period of time, uh, and. So that's an idea of where we're at in the story and where we're at. Israel's now been kept, taken captive. And now uh, the king of, of Israel, I'm sorry, of Assyria uh, has now come and laid siege uh, to Jerusalem. Okay, so uh, during this period of time, um, 
the people of Israel, they go and they send a, uh, 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 ambassadors to Egypt to get their help. And so calling upon the Lord and asking God for help, they go to Egypt to get help and to get some assistance for the battle that's, gonna, that's, that's coming up between um, uh, Assyria and with Judah. Okay, so with that said, and with the background of the story going on, uh, let's jump into Second Kings uh, 18 through, uh, or nine, eight through, 9 through 16. Um, okay, in the fourth year uh, of the king of Hezekiah, Sennacherib king of Syria came up against the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah king of Judah sent to Assyria, uh, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, uh, I will pay. And the king of Assyria assessed um, uh, uh, 300 talents of silver, and I think it's 30 talents of gold. Uh, and so um, Hezekiah takes them from the house of the Lord, the treasures of the king. Uh, they stripped the, the gold from the doors of the temple and the Lord of the Lord and from the pillars uh, which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Uh, and then some period later, uh, so they leave and they say, okay, you give us this money, we'll, we'll leave. And some period later, they come back. Um, and Sennacherib returns. Um, and um, in the book of, he in, in Isaiah 36, 4 through 10, uh, we read about how Sennacherib has returned. He sends Iraq Sheba to Jerusalem uh, to begin uh, harassing them, basically, uh, and asking and, and, and making fun of them for what uh, they're doing. Uh, and so verses 4 through 10, uh, then Iraq Sheba said to them, to say to Hezekiah, uh, say to the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is, is, is this in which you trust? Uh, I say to you, speak, you have plans and powers of war, but they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of the broken reed Egypt, uh, on which if a man leans, he will go in, uh, it will go into his hand and pierce it. Uh, so is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. Uh, but if you say, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not uh, he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now, therefore, I urge you to give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to put riders on them. Uh, how then will you, repay one, will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants? And you put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Uh, have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against the, this land and destroy it. Which we again talked about a second ago. Um, so the word had gotten back to uh, Sennacherib that they had gone out to, uh, to get uh, this envoy uh, from Egypt. And so that, that info had come back to them that they had gone seeking the help of Egypt. Um, and we know that that's always a bad idea. Um, Israel has always had a, and had a bad uh, rap, as it were, with Egypt. Uh, we've seen that with Abraham. When Abraham first went down there, he uh, had to lie about his wife so that he wouldn't uh, they, they were scared that he was going to get killed for his wife. Uh, we had the 40 years of, uh, of bondage that they had um, and, and the, how they came out of Egypt because of the Lord's deliverance. Um, we see that this period of time that they, they're not supposed to be asking uh, the hand of, um, uh, of Egypt, but they're supposed to be trusting on the Lord. And we see that again uh, in Jeremiah when after the after the kingdom has fallen, um, there, uh, God's told them that they're being punished. And they know they're being punished, and Jeremiah is telling them what's going to happen. Uh, but yet, uh, in Jeremiah 43, um, they uh, were told to stay in Jerusalem, that God would take care of them, protect them. But the people decide instead to leave, uh, and that's when. Uh, in Jeremiah 43, I'll be there in two seconds, um, that they go to, um, I can't even say it, to ha uh, Tathanes, um, which is uh, this area where they go to, uh, and then uh, uh, the king of Babylon comes uh, and gets them from there and punishes them, and, and they're told in advance, don't, don't go down there 
stay in Jerusalem, that you'll be protected, uh, that, that I've, uh, I've ordained all of this, that you'll be safe. And instead of listening to the word of the Lord again, they still decide to disobey the word of the Lord. And, and they go down Jerusalem, through Egypt, and uh, many people die because of it. Okay, so again, with all that said, now we're going to uh, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Uh, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, and who devise plans but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk down to go to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh and trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. And again, uh, that's talking about Jeremiah 43.1. Uh, it refers also to how they were told not to go back down there. Um, when it talks about the rebellious children, uh, I know as, as parents, uh, one of the worst things a parent can have is a child who's rebellious because we want desperately to see our kids accomplish and do well. And they're rebelling against us or rebelling against the Lord uh, it really hurts our hearts and, our, and our, uh, our, our, our care for our children because we want to see them do good. And, and, and our Lord is no different because he, he has a plan for us. He has um, this, this goal for our lives. But yet, uh, as, as these people have done here, they're rebelling against it. Uh, they've chosen not to even ask the Lord what to do, uh, not besides even following it. They're just not even going to ask him. So they've, they have these plans um, but, um, but they're not of the Lord, and they have, they, they're seeking counsel. They're asking everyone else what to do. What should we do? What should we do? Except for asking the one person that they should ask, which is the Lord. Um, and again, so they may add sin to sin. The first sin is, is choosing to disobey the Lord, and the second sin is not even asking him what to do and seeking his counsel and his guidance. Um, uh, who walked down to go to Egypt and asked, uh, and not asked my advice, to strengthen themselves in the, in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. When I think of this, uh, a lot of commentators have said the shadow of Egypt refers to the weakness of, of, of Egypt. Uh, when I think of it, it reminds me of, you know, uh, a kid who's standing in the shadow of your parents. You know, when, when mom or dad or your big brother is around, is that you're standing in the shadow of your big brother saying, yeah, yeah, but behind you is your big brother. And they're trying to do that with Egypt, that Egypt's going to be their protection. And Egypt's going to be there to, to watch their back, as it were. Uh, but what God says is different. Um, it says, therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. Uh, and Now, the reason for this is it comes to the next verse in verse 4. For his princes went to Zone, and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them, or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. So Egypt, the, the Egyptian ambassadors come down and they see that Israel, I mean, Egypt is weak as a country, but Israel, is, or Judah is even weaker as a country. And so they're saying, well, the point of this, uh, this you know, uh, tie here or this, this, uh, uh, this agreement we have with this nation is gonna, not going to benefit, benefit us at all. And so it's, it's embarrassing that uh, when they come there and say, these guys can't, can't benefit us at all uh, with, their, with us helping them. Uh, the burden against, uh, going into verse 6, the burden against the beasts of the south through a land of trouble and anguish from which came the lions and the lions, the lioness and the lions, the viper and the f uh, fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore, I have called her Rahab him Shabbat. Now, uh, Rahab him Shabbat, what that means is um, Rahab uh, sits idle. And Rahab is using that term to refer to Egypt as the Egypt sits idle, basically. Uh, the English Standard Version uh, says Egypt's health is worth, uh, that same verse, Egypt's health is, help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab who sits still. Um, again, Israel, uh, uh, Isaiah is describing all those that go down to Egypt would have to go through to reach it, Egypt, through all the, the trials and all the things that they'd have to go through, the desert, facing the lions and the lionesses, 
uh, this, this fly, fiery flying serpent. Now, I looked up what the heck is this fiery flying serpent? Is it a lizard? Is it a, a, a you know, a bat? Um, the only mention that it has is, uh, remember the story of uh, when, uh, when they're going through uh, the 40 years of wandering, uh, and um, there is uh, uh, people bickering, and, and the, fiery, the fiery serpents come through and biting people, uh, and they have to make the brass, uh, the bat, the brass uh, uh, rod with the, the symbol on top of it, which is the medical symbol. Um, that is the only mention of these fiery red serpent, or the fi these fiery serpents is there, uh, and that they're, uh, uh, so what these things are, I've got no clue, but it does point that they're going through a lot of heartache just to go there for basically nothing. Um, uh, okay, so um, now going into the next section here, um, uh, in Second Chronicles 18, uh, through uh, verse 4, when Jehoshaphat is going to war uh, with the king of Israel before the, the, um, the breakdown of the countries, uh, he tells them to seek the counsel of the Lord, uh, but the people wouldn't, and they, and they go, and they, and, and they say, okay, and so they bring all these prophets in. If you remember the story, um, there's the guy with the, the brass horns, or, or I think they were brass, and he's talking about how with these horns you're going to break the uh, the Assyrians uh, and um, uh, Jehoshaphat says, "Is there anybody uh, who's a man of God here?" Because even Jehoshaphat knows all these guys are full of malarkey, and not one of them is really prophesying for the Lord. And uh, I think it's Ahab was the king says, "Yeah, there's one guy, but I hate him because they're talking about he speaks. He's just always bad news." And he says, "Well, don't say that. And you'll send for the guy." And the guy comes and he tells them, yeah, you're going to be defeated in this battle, and you're not going to survive it. So uh, in verse 8, and with that in mind, verse 8, now go write uh, it before them on a tablet and not on a scroll, or sorry, and note it on a scroll, that it, be, that it will be for a time to come, forever and ever. This is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law. Uh, and again, uh, when I read verse 9 as a parent, uh, my wife and I, have, we have one rule for our kids, and that is don't lie to us. And you can, if you get in trouble, fine, but don't ever lie to us, because if, you, if we catch you lying, your punishment is twice to three times what it was uh, from just doing whatever you did. If you, you know, were fighting with your brother or did something bad, but then on top of lie to it, lie to us, that's, you're in just really, really bad trouble. Because as parents, we have to have the trust of our children to know that they're not going to lie to us, that we can, that, we, that they're going to tell us the truth, even though they're going to get in trouble, at least they know to tell the truth. Um, and the second part of that is children who will not hear the law of the Lord. You know, as parents, again, when we see our children and to think that my children won't hear the law of the Lord and how that hurts as a parent. And here's God saying that. God saying that his children are lying children, that his, that his people he's called are lying children that won't listen to him and they won't hear the law of the Lord how that has to hurt the, the heart of the Lord, but then we have love for, for the Judah and for, for the Jewish people. I mean, uh, it's, it's got to be devastating for him and Brenda to say, no, write this so that it cannot be erased on tablets of stone, you know, and, and on a scroll so it can't be, you know, just forgotten about. This is, this is how these people are living. Uh, and in our t t today's society, we see that uh, occurring in a couple of places. In 2 Timothy 4, three through four, for the time will come when, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because of their itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to, to fables. And then again in Romans 1, 21 through 32, says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, will become futile in their thoughts. Uh, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Uh, their God, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, uh, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who was blessed forever. Amen. 
And the verse continues to go down all the way through 32, talking about how, uh, how man has chosen uh, anything and, and everything except for God. Uh, that in just in every way and we see it in our culture today we see it uh, in the fact that uh, that as a society you know uh, Chase Bank it came out just yesterday Chase Bank sent out a memo to all their employees you know and said please circle which of these apply to you and one of the two things were on there is I, su I support uh, the uh, gay and bisexual agen uh, uh, agenda that and that you either circle yes or you don't support it, one of the two. So if you don't circle it, well, obviously you don't support it. Uh, where, um, and usually in commencement speeches, kids will, in, in many places, will quote the Lord and, and give thanks to God. And in many of uh, the uh, commencement addresses uh, this year, many of them were uh, censored by the schools and say, well, you can't mention the Lord's name. And uh, thankfully, many of the kids uh, rejected that and, uh, and the there are several cases of people who just outright uh, just said, oh, yeah, I was told not to say this, but, and, and there's one kid who actually, he, who starts you know, saying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the audience was appreciative of that. But, but that's the world that we're living in right now. The Ten Commandments are being removed from, from everywhere. The prayer is being removed from everywhere. Um, but more than that, when we look at the church, and we look at the church and the apostate church, the church we're living in, where... Um, uh, the Presbyterian Church voted on June 19th to allow homosexual marriages. This is a vote of 76%, a three-to-one margin, that they would uh, openly support homosexual marriages. Uh, that two, contra two, pre uh, two uh, TV evangelists, when I was a kid, Ke Kenneth Copeland was someone who was pretty big on, on TV. You would watch him. Uh, James Robinson was two, two really big people that were on TV all the time, and, he was, and as a kid, we watched Kenneth Copeland, and we watched um, uh, James Robinson, and both of them met with the Pope and talking about um, uh, bringing down the walls of division within the church and, and having uh, unity within the churches between Catholic and Protestant. And, and of course, we know that is pointing towards a one-world religion and, and drawing away from, uh, from the Lord and establishing this way of, of everything's acceptable except for the Word of God. Uh, and that's the where we're going right now. Pastor Albert also mentioned that uh, on, on Sunday, talking about how uh, as we as Christians, how sometimes I know in my personal life, how you, when, when I walked away from the Lord from it for a long period of time, how you feel far from God and how you feel like, you know, my prayers aren't really accomplishing anything. And the reason for that is God hasn't gone anywhere. It's because you've gone, that you've walked away, that you stopped worshiping and praying and seeking the Lord. And fellowshipping with his, his, his fellow, with fellow believers and, and taking the word and meaning it what it's not supposed to mean and then and how that um, slowly draws us further and further from God. Uh, I personally believe that God is starting to is really starting to, to winnow his church down and getting to people who, who are really for me or who are just playing the game. And that God's getting to that point of saying, are you a believer? Or are you going to play the game? And if you're playing the game, I'm going to make it obvious to everyone who is a believer so they can avoid you as, and, and you know, we, we all know where you're at. Okay, uh, going on to the next uh, is um, back to... Okay. Again, uh, uh, who say to seers, do not see any prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. This is verse 10 of Isaiah 30. Um, speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Uh, get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease before us. And just that verse alone. Are we not seeing that in America? And are we not seeing it through the world in churches? Uh, Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity uh, and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant, and he shall break it 
like the breakers of a potter's vessel, who is broken to pieces, he shall not spare. So there shall not be found among its fragments a shard to take fire from the earth, for the hearth, or to take water from the cistern. And so God's saying, when this, when this punishment comes to Israel, to Judah, that, that nothing would be left, that, that punishment would be uh, very severe, that, that a pot, you can even find a piece of pottery to go get, some, get a fire out of the stove, that no, nothing would even carry that, that it would completely destroy it. And we saw that when Israel fell, uh, or when Judah fell, and Jerusalem fell, and they went into captivity, that when they came back and they were rebuilding the, the, uh, the walls, that they were just crumbling stones. Uh, and uh, the enemies of Judah were harassing them and saying, you're trying to build a wall of these little these, these crumbling stones? You're kidding me. Uh, and of course, God did bless them and help them, but it shows how God's punishment uh, was so severe and how he kept his word. Uh, and when we see people, God doesn't want anyone uh, to, to fall, uh, but yet his word is true and his word is, is set in stone. We can't just say, well, I'm, I'm not going to follow. If, we, if a person goes to hell because they've chosen to reject the word of the Lord, it's not that, oh, well, you know, we, we, I, we, I didn't know, but because you, the word of God is, is, is set in stone, and if you've heard it, you know. And, and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord someday. And people is going to be either voluntary or is going to be you know, through uh, submission and being forced to submit. But each one will have to say to, say to, to the Lord, you are Lord someday. Um, okay, this punishment was from God. Um, okay, now in verse 15 though it's it switches and again this went to me when I read these verses uh, sometimes I'm reading through the different prophecies and at one moment God's talking about I'm going to punish you you guys are going to are going to go into captivity in the next verse and God's talking about how he's going to bless them and protect them uh, and it's when I think of it initially I go wow that's, that's weird wait a second Just one, one verse ago you're talking about how you're going to punish them now you're talking about how you're going to bless them um, but when I think about it, uh, it, I realize how much he really, 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 really loves us. That in one hand, he's saying, stop it, you're a bad kid. Oh, but I love you, stop, you, I'll help you, I'll help you. In the very next verse, because he loves us so much. I mean, the Bible says that he loves us so much, he gave his only son, you know, that, that we would have eternal life. I mean, he could give, you know, his son to die for us. It is an amazing so again, I'm like saying, sorry. Um, uh, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not. And you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore, you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. Now, when I was reading this verse, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Uh, I was Googling it and looking it up. Um, this is actually a punishment that God's giving here and God's describing. He's saying, you know, I was willing to bless you. I was willing to take care of you and to protect you, but you guys didn't want it. And so, okay, so you, you want it the other way? Okay, great. But when you go online and you Google this, the health and wealth doctrine people have taken this verse and made whole, pro er, whole doctrines out of this one verse. You know, about uh, and, and showing and the Bible, and again, this shows how to take one verse out of context. You can make an entire doctrine, which is completely the God, against the Word of God. I mean, yes, God's saying, I want to bless you, but if you skip that one sentence, but you would not, you would say, oh, okay, God's going to bless me. But you missed that next sentence, but you would not. And you'd say, for we, and you say, no, we will flee on horses. And God says, you shall flee, and we will ride on swift horses. And God says, Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. So God's saying, you're going to get punished. You think you're so fast? Okay, the guy's chasing you. They're faster than you. Uh, and and you, you think you're going to flee? You're going to flee, all right. Uh, and so, you know, this is a punishment that, God, that God's bringing because he's saying, you know, you didn't choose me. Instead, you're choosing your own way. And, and then 1,000 shall flee at the threat of one, and the threat of five you shall flee. Um, and verse 17, that is a, a direct contradiction to, the, to the, the promises and the blessings that we see in Leviticus. In Leviticus, he's, he's talking about 
when, we, when the people of Judah and Jerusalem were serving him, that, that, uh, that uh, ten will, will cause to fly a thousand. And uh, I don't remember the exact verse, I don't have it down, but he's talking about how he's going to bless them so much that ten people can make an entire army run away. Uh, and this is the complete opposite now. He's saying the opposite. He's saying that 1,000 shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee, until your left is a pole on top of a mountain and as a banner on a hill. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have been to California or not. In Southern California, there's a place called uh, uh, Mount Baldy. Uh, Mount Baldy is the reason it's called Mount Baldy, because there's no trees on Mount Baldy. Um, uh, the reason being that is because a long time ago, they went up there and they chopped down all the pine trees. Pine trees take a long, long time to grow back. And maple trees can grow really quick in place of palm trees or pine trees. The problem with that, though, is when they die, then there's nothing. And Mount Baldy is known because there's no trees there. And it's a bald mountain instead of, instead of being that way. And when, you, when I see this verse, I think of that. And, and imagine an entire mountain and you can see one tree, you know, or you know, uh, or, you know, you'd see one banner on a hilltop, you know, um, in the, 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 that kid's song verse, his banner over me is love. There's only one banner up there. And so uh, and banners were like the symbol of, of a, a military unit. When you're in the military, each unit has their own little guide on or little banner. Uh, if you were, I was in the Marine Corps, and each unit had their own little banner. And, and so when you went running or you went to a parade or in the, in the military, there's tons of parades and ceremonies. And what happens is they bring all the banners to the front. And so you see row upon row and row on a battalion level, you'd see tons and tons and tons of these guidons with little little banners for the, you know, 1067 or, or 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines or 2nd Platoon. And, and you just have tons and tons of these little flags everywhere symbolizing that your unit was there. And, and, but if you were to have that with just one banner there, it'd, it'd be like, well, where's the rest of your people at? And this is all you've got. And back then, this is the same way. You were proud of your unit. You were proud of who you stood for and your people. You know, we're the, from the tribe of Ishakar. You know, we're from the tribe of Benjamin. Here's our, here's our, our, our banner for our family. And now there's only one. And just that, 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 that desolation that's left. Um, uh, going to verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted that he, have may, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. God is very patient. Uh, he waits for us to realize our need for him. He waits until we reach the end of ourselves and no longer able to do anything on our own. And we call out to him. Uh, that way he gets the glory uh, and is exalted as he works in our life. Uh, that's, uh, I'm a prime example. Prime, that's, that's me to a T. Uh, I mean, uh, I, when God allowed me to, to get to the end of my rope, and God allowed me to get to the end of me, then that's when the beginning of God showed up. And he says, okay, you're done. Are you give up yet? And I'm like, okay, I give up. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And then he showed up, and he did miracles. As those of you who know my story, no, God did, God did miracles. But it only was when I got out of the way, then he could say, okay, and then we, I can bless you now. And that's what he wants to do. He says, I'll wait, because he wants to get the glory. You know, when... Um, one thing that, that, that I talk with the kids when I'm teaching the kids is, is uh, that God wants to get the glory. We try and take glory for ourselves. Uh, prime example, uh, Billy Graham. Billy Graham's three rules. Don't take, touch the women, don't touch the money, don't touch the glory. And Billy Graham flourished because of it, because he, he maintained those three things. And God gets the glory. He wants the glory. He, he can use anybody. If you get out of the way and give him the glory and say, God did it, God did it, keep pointing to him, God will use you. The minute you say, oh, wow, I did a great job. Uh, sorry, you're, you're on the shelf again. Get out of the way. And, but God wants to do that. He wants, to, he wants the glory as he uses us. And we're, again, he could use anybody in the world, but he chooses to use us. And when we think about that, when you think about all the things we've done wrong, all the things that, that would normally disqualify us from service and does normally disqualify us from something, anything that would, God would use, but yet he would still say, I'm going to use this guy. And because of that, because he can say, okay, I can get the glory for it, because everyone knows this guy's a schmuck. And literally, in my case. Um, <laughs> but, instead of, uh, oh, instead of you. Um, but because of that, um, God gets the glory. 
and I was going to pick on uh, Tristan before I got distracted there. Today, or all this week, I've been doing the physicals uh, for the AWC football team, the entire football team. So uh, I, I think I saw like 40 so far. <laughs> Um, but the entire football team, I mean, and there's Samoan guys there who make Jack look short. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, the, the, the tallest guy was 6'10". I mean, his arms, uh, I said, okay, so one of the things you have to do is you check their balance. Put your feet together, put your arms out like that. The guy does that, his arms are up here above my head. And I'm going, okay, I feel short now. <laughs> and I thought of Tristan. <laughs> but... Um, but when I think about that, I mean, um, you know, it's just, you know, humbling how God would use us to, just to, to bless those guys or to just be certain to him uh, as he gets the credit, uh, as he uses us. Uh, continuing on, um, and God, in verse 19, For the people shall dwell in Zion in Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. Uh, he will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Again, my favorite uh, psalm is Psalm 116. If you haven't read it yet, read the entire thing. If you don't cry halfway through like I do every single time, something's wrong. <laughs> because it, I mean, it, it just, the one, just the first verse, uh, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my supplications. When I think about that, God's heard my prayers and, and, he, and, he, and I love him because of that. And I, I just love that, ver that chapter. It's an amazing chapter. Uh, and, the, and going to verse 20, and though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into the corner anymore. So again, they're saying, you're not going to be rejecting your teachers. You're not going to be pushing them aside and say, we don't want to hear you anymore. Instead, we're going to listen to you. Uh, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Uh, again, uh, we're going to, you li listen to your teachers, the, the lack of pride and the willingness to listen to God's instructions. Verse 21. You shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whether you turn to the right hand or the left, uh, or whether you turn to the left, you also will defile the curvings of your images of silver and your ornaments of, mold, of your molded images of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing. You will say to them, get away. So uh, the, the Holy, uh, verse 21, a lot, of people, a lot of people think it's talking about the Holy Spirit directing our lives and influencing us and directing us that voice behind us saying, oh, whether to the left or the right, you, someone will tell you which way to go. And the Holy Spirit does that to us as he directs our lives and tells us, go this way, go that way, um, and, and, and gives us that direction. And, uh, and then in verse 22, that they're, they're getting rid of their images of gold and silver, those things, those false gods, those false uh, beliefs that they had, and returning back to the, to the Lord and saying we don't want those things and get rid of them. Uh, and instead, they're calling upon the name of the Lord uh, for direction and for, to, to serve him. Uh, 23, then he will, give you the rain, he will give you the rain for your seed with which you will sow to the ground and bread of the increase of, of the earth. Uh, it will be fat and plentiful. In that day, your cattle will be fed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, uh, which has been winnowed with a shovel and fan. There will be on every high mountain, every hill, high hill, rivers and streams of water. In the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, and moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the days the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. Again, God's saying he's going to bless them. Israel and this land is a very dry, desolate place it can be. I mean, he's saying that during this period of time, on every high hill and every mountain, rivers and streams of water. He's saying that you're not going to be worried about water. The basic necessity of life is water. Everyone needs it. And he's saying there's going to be plenty of that. Uh, and uh, now 26 is an interesting verse that uh, is, and, and this one's uh, kind of confusing. I'm looking over it and trying to find where, what people thought about it. And a lot of people are thinking this is during the, during Reve from Revelation, the day of the Lord. Um, and, and the light of the, the sun will be seven full. Some people think they're talking about supernova, uh, and as uh, the sun and the moon will, will fade away, uh, and a new earth and, and a new sun will be, will be made, and, and God will be their sun, and they'll have neither day or night there anymore. Uh, and a lot of people are thinking that's that's referring to that period. And the last verse, our section of verses, will be in Isaiah 55, verse six. 
which says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And our God, uh, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are your, not your thoughts, nor our ways, or th nor your ways, my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Um, you know, the world we're living in uh, is corrupt, uh, to say the least, um, you know, and to put it in the most mildest form. And when we see that and we see what's going on in our world, uh, oftentimes it's hard to say, God, what are you doing and why are you doing this? Why are we going through these things? Why do we have Barack Obama as president? Uh, but I tell people this all the time, God's not in heaven going, oh no, they elected Barack Obama. No, God's going, okay, Barack Obama is now president. Okay, now he's going to do this. Okay, illegal immigrants, illegal immigrants are cover crossing the border. Everything is completely planned out. I mean, we think about this. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. And just think about that. Before God said, let there be light, he already planned to die on the cross. That was already pre-planned pre and preordained. The Bible says, before the foundation of the earth, I knew you. So before I was even born, before he, he said, let there be light, he knew me. And that's amazing. He chose me anyhow. Um, but when you think about that, so when we look at our society and our world today, and we, we, we get our, ourselves all nervous and all frustrated because we're saying, what's going on in our country? But God's not frustrated. He's not going up, okay, okay, what the guy's doing now? He's completely planned out and by his perfect will. Um, and so trusting in God, knowing that he's going to work out his plan, but at the same time reaching a world that's lost. Um, every day there's opportunities to reach somebody. Every day there's a chance to say, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Do you know? I, I had the opportunity the other day, I was seeing this patient, and this female was, was in front of me, and I was talking to her, and I started talking about the Lord, and, and talking to her about, you know, uh, uh, how God was gonna, God's going to do this, God do that, and she's, oh yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. Uh, well, what church did you go to? Oh, the Mormon church. And I'm going, can I ask you, and, I, and luckily I'd seen this patient a few times, so I knew her a little well, and I said, can I, can I talk to you about something? And she said, well, what? You're in a false religion. And she said, what? And I said, you're in a false religion. And so I brought those facts. What, what is, what's, the, what's the sin of Adam and Eve? Wanting to be like God. When, when they saw the fruit, they wanted to make men wise. That they took an aid of it. What was, the, or what was Satan said? He wanted, to say, he wanted to be like God. What's a Mormon's belief? You can be like God. And so I showed her these things. And, and she, she, at the end of it, I said, I didn't want to push her, but she said, well, I'm going to think about it. But those opportunities exist every day for us. And if we're not taking them, then we're dishonoring the Lord by not, by not sharing what we've been blessed with. I mean, we're saved. We're going to go to heaven. God's forgiven us. He's given us that new name. And when I think about that, and I think how I have a new name, that, that I am a son of God, you know, that I'm chosen by him, uh, it's, it's an honor uh, uh, to serve him. And I want to take every chance I can to reach out as many, much much as I can to share people how much God can bless their lives. So, with that said, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, God, for all that you've done in our lives. How you have chosen us for this generation, for this time, and for this world that we live in. How you have blessed us with uh, the strength and the knowledge of your word. Uh, to prepare us for this time, Lord. Lord, that you give us its strength uh, to stand for you in this world, that we would share your love with those that we meet, that we would stand boldly before your throne and proclaim you to those who are lost and dying. Help us, God, to resist the temptation to hide uh, amongst the world, but instead to stand boldly for your throne. We ask you to just bless the rest of this night, Lord, and just bring us back on Sunday, we're going to hear more from you and let our lives shine before this world. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Let's stand together.